Okay. So, welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to have you here in the Catalyst on the Helix site for this event today with our partners, Scott Logic. Um, one of the things I, I need to do is some, is some housekeeping, so we'll get through that at the, at the start. So, uh, first of all, can you hear me? It says on this piece of paper in front of me. Yes, okay, that's, that, that's always good. Um, Tom's here to take some photographs. If you're unhappy about being photographed, then if you just let us know, we'll make sure that you don't appear in any of the photographs that we, we make available afterwards. Um, and also, parts of the events are being recorded on video and will go out on our website. Uh, we think that only people on the stage will be included in the video, so if you don't want to be in a video, you're probably okay. But again, just let us know and we can, we can, we can do a check. Uh, we don't have any fire alarms scheduled, but if they are, then we go through the theatre doors, so that you can see there's, a, there's an exit there. I think that's the right one, isn't it? It's that one over there that we would go out of the building, out of the building through. Um, the bathroom's very important. Where, where you were with your coffee, they're just behind the reception desk there if you need to, if you need to do that. Um, yeah, so I think that's all the, all the housekeeping. So we've run a set of events since we started with the National Aversion Centre for Data about three years ago. And uh, pleased to say that all together we've had about 6,000 people attend these events. Um, the history of, of, of the centre is that we, we moved into this lovely building early in 2000 and then of course we had to leave it again because of COVID. So we, we moved the events online onto Zoom and they were popular for a while but then I think Zoom fatigue set in after a bit. So we, we had a pause, but now we've started to run in-person events. We've run a couple uh, this year so far, and we'll be going to about one a month from the, from the autumn. So keep an eye out for, for, future, for future events. Um, the idea is that we see this as part of our Data Insights program. So the idea is that we want to have events which are about data strategy, which are about best practice or transferring that across different organizations. We've worked with about 600 organizations so far over the last three years, so there's lots of nice lessons which, we can, which have come out of that, which we can transfer across from one organization to, to another. And then the other area that we sometimes have events in is about technology choices. So if there's some hot area of technology, then we might run an event on that. For example, we keep hearing a lot about data warehouses and Snowflake and so on, so that's, we're pondering whether to, to run an event on that. But we're always interested in ideas for events so do let us let us know if you if you think there's a some hot topic that you would like to to get together and and, and discuss as a as a group um, so before we get to the the meat of the uh, of today what i'll do is i'll just give you a, a very brief introduction to the national innovation center for data for those of you who haven't come across us before so if i click on click on this ah one thing i need to say is that um for most of the events, we're going to rattle through the presentations and then there's a Q&A. So obviously at the Q&A, you can ask whatever you want. But if you want to post questions at any time, and that can help the person, Colin, who's running the Q&A, so that to know what questions to ask the panel, then we're on Slido. And there's this code 83111427, which we'll put up in, on the screen when we're doing the, the Q&A. But if you want to... Uh, write down or remember 83114427, that's the way to, to get questions to us. Okay, so that's, that's me. Um, now we've got a, a short video that takes about 90 seconds and saves you from about a quarter of an hour of me explaining what the National Innovation Centre for Data does, so we'll, we'll run that now. The global economy is undergoing a data-driven revolution. Public and private sector organisations that can interpret data can use the insights to vastly improve the way they operate. The National Innovation Centre for Data, or NICD for short, has been established to enable all organisations to improve their data capabilities and expertise so that they can solve problems and seize new opportunities. Created with funding from the UK Government and Newcastle University, NICD is very different to a data consultancy. Our role is to strengthen the UK economy by transferring data skills to organisations of all sizes, from small and medium-sized enterprises to huge corporates and public sector bodies like the NHS, so that we can address the UK shortage of data skills. 
Our data science experts will work with your team, supporting your project. We'll take the journey with them, navigate and help steer them towards the best solution, whilst introducing them to new data skills and techniques. We'll help them deliver an immediate return on your project by working to improve your productivity, increase your efficiency, or develop new and innovative products and services. And your team will learn how to apply what they've learned to future projects. Of course, learning doesn't stop when the project ends. You become part of the NICD ecosystem, connected to like-minded people and organisations. You can stay in touch and benefit from the shared knowledge and access to our talent pipeline of data science graduates. So the next time a data challenge or opportunity arises, your people will have the skills and the support network to manage, analyse and interpret data so that your organisation can flourish. Okay, so, so uh, I, I guess there's two messages that we like to get across through that little animation. So one of them is that we're, we're not a consultancy, so what we want to do is to work with organisations to transfer skills. We've got a team of about 15 data scientists whose job it is and the, the thing they've grown expertise in is working with people from organisations to transfer the skills those people need in order to work on their own data on their own infrastructure and address the problems and the challenges which are available, which they, which they have in those organizations. So if you want to come and work with us, what we do is we've got a, a simple way of doing this. We have a, something called a discovery workshop, which is entirely free. And that usually takes a, a couple of hours where we work, we, we get together with your organization, we go through what you see as being the challenges and opportunities and we discuss whether or not there's a possibility of running a collaborative project together. So if you're interested in that, then uh, I'm around over lunch as well as many people from the National Centre, so just have a word with us. And if you want to contact us, uh, you can go onto the, I suppose the website's the easiest way to, to get information. And uh, there's a lot of case studies in there about the projects that we've run so far. Over the last three years, we've run about 60, 60 projects, and the, the model that we have seems to be working very very well. We've worked with companies of all sizes from multinationals down to uh, SMEs and including the public sector as well, so councils, the NHS and so on. So we've developed a expertise in working across a wide range of organisations. Okay, all right, so if I go back to that. So, um, so today we're delighted to be working with Scott Logic. Um, so Scott Logic, I'm sure many of you are, are aware now, are a, a software consultancy. They've got offices around the UK, but they've just moved into an office over there, just to be neighbours with us in the, in, in the next building. And uh, we're pleased to work with them because they, they share a similar ethos, which is that how do we use technology in order to address the challenges that organisations organizations have? Um, I'm particularly pleased to be working with... Uh, Scott Logic today because I was around at the, uh, at the very early stages of Scott Logic. The founder Gary Scott, in about 2005, when he was working in London and thinking of setting up uh, his own his own company, he brought up to uh, to Newcastle, and I was one of the people who who he met a group of potential clients from one of the world's largest financial houses, with the idea that if he could persuade them that Newcastle was a good place to set up a for him to set up a business and there was lots of tech talent around, then they could be the, the anchor client for, for Scott Logic. And uh, with a big financial institution funding projects, that would give them a, a solid basis to, to work from and then they could develop other clients. And uh, that, that company was Lehman Brothers. So, uh, so it, didn't, it didn't quite uh, uh, work out. And in fact, one of the amazing things about uh, Scott Logic is that. I think I'm right that when it, the financial crash happened, Lehman Brothers were the only uh, customer of Scott Logic, but they were able to, because they established a reputation, then they were able to, to pivot and get other clients and, and grow and expand enormously. So we're very pleased to be working with them today. And I'll hand over now to Colin, Colin Eberhardt, who's the CTO of Scott Logic, who's going to uh, chair the, the first few sessions of today. So, Colin. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm your continuity guy for the, um, for the first part of the morning, which means I get to waffle while the presenters struggle with the AV. So, Pete, I don't know if yours is already 
Yeah, you, you can struggle in, with your presenter view and whatever else. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for the introduction. So I'm Colin Eberhardt. I'm the CTO of Scott Logic. Oh, <laughs> all right then. Thanks. <laughs> I'll, I'll waffle for a bit That's longer. Simple. That simple. Nice one. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm the CTO of Scott Logic. It's it's fascinating actually that you've heard uh, just a little bit about the early part of Scott Logic, the early journey where actually I wasn't part of it. I joined Scott Logic 16 years ago, so I was employee number 20, and I was actually around at the time of the financial crisis with Lehman Brothers going down. Um, it, it was you know a, a stressful time for Scott Logic. I, I'm not going to give you the full history, but fast forward all the way up to today. We're now around about 450 people based uh, across the UK, a number of different offices. We build applications for clients across a, a relatively wide range of industry sectors. Um, and, and, and I very much uh, agree with Paul. We, we have a very similar ethos. The, the video, we don't have a flashy video, I'm afraid, but the, the video where, where the, the animated characters talked about taking clients on a journey, that's our aim as well. We don't just build solutions for our clients and wave goodbye. We, we genuinely try to take them on a journey. Our, our hope is that, that when we leave, they're, they're genuinely in a, in a better place. So I've attended a number of events uh, in this building, and that's the reason why we thought uh, we'd put on a, an event ourselves and, and share some of our thoughts around data strategy. So I'm not going to steal Pete's thunder who is now hiding off stage. I'm going to pass you straight over to Pete, who's going to be talking about uh, why you cannot buy a data strategy off the shelf. Yeah, and um, oh, it sounds like this, the microphone's working as well. It is. Oh, that's fabulous. Great, um, great tech setup, uh, which you'd expect, of course. Uh, it really is uh, a privilege to be um, talking here. And as Colin said, as I was watching that video, I was reflecting, I think, just on how much kind of synergy there, there will be with this, this talk, I hope. Um, you can't buy a data strategy off the shelf. Um, I think the counterpoint to that is that I think we see people trying to do that sometimes. Um, it's a 90s themed talk, um, so I'm going to go a little bit off the uh, corporate slide deck with this one. Um, uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit about what we experience, what we see uh, working with clients uh, with big data technology, and uh, some of the issues that we find with that, um, uh, that we do find that clients are trying to do uh, the undoable by uh, kind of just procuring their way to having a great strategy. Um, the middle part of the talk, I'm actually going to go back to the 1990s and try and look at a case study. I think it's quite interesting to try to get ourselves away from um, the kind of the technological status quo and sort of think outside of that. Um, and then at the end, I'll try and tie it into, I think uh, my colleagues, um, James and Sinead, are going to be talking later about some work that they've been doing with the Foreign Office. And actually, there's some real parallels between those case studies um, that I'm going to try and draw out for us. Um, but first, if you've been on the internet um, any time recently, you'd have seen this. Have you seen this? This is uh, the, the Dolly uh, AI draw, draw an image from any prompt. And what I want to do is just think about some of the technology you can buy off the shelf, at least you try to buy off the shelf, um, through the lens of Dolly AI image prompts. Um, what's that? Anyone? Colin? It's a data warehouse, right? OK, see a lot of those. Everyone's got one of those. Anyone work somewhere that doesn't have a data warehouse? Um, and this one? Data lake, right? It's data lake. And this one's going to throw you a bit, because it's not the uh, start screen from Windows XP. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a data lake house. OK, and these are the kinds of technologies that we see uh, a lot in, in organizations. In fact, less data lake house is a very new buzzwordy thing. I've kind of included that just as a kind of the present buzzword world. I think Dolly did a pretty good job uh, there. You can see how it's taken data warehouseness and, and mostly into data lakeness. And uh, data lake house is just there fully in the cloud, as you can see. I didn't even put cloud in the prompt, and it already knows, right? So <laughs> uh, these effectively are uh, generations of data infrastructure that we see all over the place in any kind of big cor corporate enter enterprise. Um, and everywhere that people are deploying them, they're trying to get some value out of them. Like if you think about the kind of conversations that happen at board level, we want to procure a big new data warehouse. It's going to deliver a load of value for our business, right? Cool sign here. Um, go off and do a, do a big procurement and integration. <laughs> I'm here to say, but how much value do, do organizations actually get out of that? Um, 
we know like, that organizations see the big data infrastructure as a necessary foundation, to, particularly to transformation in their businesses. Uh, organizations will spend a lot of effort to try and get a competitive advantage, and they're very willing um, to put a lot of money and time into getting the right technology in place. Um, and these, these sorts of technologies do promise really great things. Um, but in my experience, organizations aren't often getting the value that they hope for, certainly not for the amount of bucks they're paid. Um, data has often becomes hard to access within the organization almost as a result of doing the big procurement. I was actually talking to, to one of the, the Nick D uh, team earlier um, who made almost the same point to me, completely unprompted, that you, know, you go and you see a big data warehouse in a place, you go, oh my gosh, on this big corporation, how am I actually going to get that data to work with as a data scientist? Um, for the organization, skills are often in really short supply. And that's, again, like why it's so great to be talking to Nick D and why the mission of, of Nick D is so important, I think. Um, because organizations often don't really know how to get the best out of these uh, systems. Um, and the governance that organizations put around it, as I said, it can become a barrier, uh, whether it's information security, gov governance, or um, uh, other kinds of, uh, sort of data, data protection governance. Um, finally, organizations end up in cycles of re-procurement. I see this a lot. I was working with a client recently. Um, and talking about their data warehouse. Um, they were unhappy with their data warehouse, cost a lot of money, costs a lot of money to run, they don't really have the skills, can't access the data, all of these things, okay? Um, so their plan is to do, a, do a, a refresh, right? They wanna go and procure some new tech to fix the old tech. So the aggregate of all of this kind of behavior is often that innovation is engineered out. Go into an organization, you find that like, actually, the people they're trying to do stuff with the data, there's a small number of them, they don't have the school skills, they don't have the tooling, there's a load of data somewhere and they can't get to it. I've seen that a number of times. I was at a, um, a, a council, actually, talking public sector, um, uh, working with a council, talking to some of their data science team. Um, I found that they weren't permitted to install Python or R on their laptops or on their computers. They had a data science team who knew how to use the tools and they weren't allowed to install them. Really interesting. But when we think about that kind of re-procurement cycle, in an organization where you've gone through this whole cycle, I'm going to buy this big thing, I'm going to invest all of this money, um, only to find that it doesn't work. And then you go, I know what I'm going to do. To fix this, I'm going to do the same thing again. Um, this is a classic. I nicked this from uh, Simon Wardley. He's a kind of strategy guy, and he posted this on Twitter. I don't know where he got it from. But it's a classic. Our systems were a mess of eight previous major IT projects. Great, we'll build a new Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> we'll learn the lessons from the past. Oh, we've now got a mess of nine major IT projects, so we're going to build another Death Star. We'll get a data lake house this time. That's sure to work, right? So those generations, and this is actually marketing, marketing material from Databricks. Now, I don't mean to um, be overly critical of, uh, of Databricks. I don't know the technology. I'm sure it's great and, and a good company. I'm not trying to make any kind of point about these being bad technologies any, anyway. Um, but if you're the business going through the Death Star re-procurement, what is it that makes you think that the late 80s, 90s data warehouse or the 2011 data lake that didn't work for you, right? But you're going to get a 2020 lake house and that's going to work for you this time. What, if it's not working with the, the technology on the left, why will it start working if you just plug in more technology on the right? And I think that's the question I, would, <laughs> I have posed to people in, in organizations before and I will continue to pose. Because there's a missing piece that isn't answered by technology. Going to the technology shop and saying, oh, I want the shiniest new computers, please. And it's not the vendor's fault, right? You back up your truck full of money to the vendor. <laughs> you say, load it up with data computers. And the vendor says, of course, here you go. Here's all of our data computers. Brilliant. Right? I'm sure that'll work for you. It's not their job to work out how to get value out of this system. Yeah, that's something that the organization can only do for themselves. So you can't just buy your way to having a great uh, data strategy. OK, act two. I said I was going back to the 90s with this. Uh, we are going back to the 90s, OK? Um, <laughs> what I want to do, as I said at the top, is get away from kind of just going, OK, cool, let's go and look at the cloud. Let's go and look at what we would do. And let's go and look at more technologies and how we'd actually do that in real life. And James will talk more about <laughs> actually how we'll go and do that in real life. Um, I want to go back to 1994, because that's my happy place. That's when I was a kid. Um, cast of friends there. And, uh, and these guys, and this is not a 1994 photo. I think they've aged a bit since 1994. Does anyone know who these people are? 
They were not in Neighbours. And, no, and they are not the presenters from Homes Under the Hammer. Um, but, no, these are two of the um, pioneering, most important data innovators that the UK's ever produced. Uh, their names are Edwina Dunn and Clive Humby. They're a husband and wife team. Um, and if you haven't ever heard of them, uh, you'll have heard of the term data is the new oil. Uh, Clive Humby coined the, the, the phrase data is the new oil in 2006. Ish, but we're back in 1994. He hasn't done that yet. Before he was coining the term data is the new oil, uh, Edwina and, and, and he worked on this. Hey, everyone got one of these? Anyone not got one of these in the house somewhere? In the bottom of your purse, in your, you know, in your, in your jacket pocket? Um, Tesco Clubcard is obviously, well, obviously one of the most successful corporate data strategies ever. Um, uh, but it's a surprisingly small-scale story of innovation. It's not a story of taking a big truckload of money to the local data technology vendor, okay? Um, uh, Dunn and Humby were already in a, had a small business. They were doing uh, their mathematics and statistics background. So I think, I think uh, Clive Humby, Humby's a mathematician. I think Edwin Dunn's a statistician. I may be wrong. They had this tiny little company. It was kind of Scott Logic post Lehman Brothers size, I think, probably. Um, <laughs> Uh, and this guy, Terry Lee, who was the head of um, uh, marketing at uh, Tesco at the time, had heard about them at this conference, and they were doing some really interesting work with data. He himself had been thinking, how can we use data in Tesco to market uh, our products to people more effectively? So he got in touch with them, um, and they started this bit of work, and they just looked at nine stores, completely analog, as far as I understand, um, looking at patterns of population, consumer spending, uh, choices that consumers were making in the stores, they looked at census data in the local area. They layered demographics. They layered geography. These were all things that the data scientists in the room will go, yeah, cool, they're the things you'd do, right? This wasn't the things you did if you were a supermarket in 1994, okay? <laughs> um, they went into this work, and then they demonstrated the potential to Tesco's board. So, so Lee, at the time, obviously, was on Tesco's board as a kind of chief marketing officer or whatever he might have been called. Um, and they went and showed this kind of proof of, of potential here for marketing. Like we can market better if we understand customers better. Uh, so yeah, Edwina's on. We, we thought, why don't we take people's customers' data and see what separates them from each other? <laughs> Sorry, I've had Terry Lee here at the bottom there. Just for fun. I'm having, I had fun. I found online, Adobe have a, uh, an online tool where you can take the background out of pictures. I love when you find a tool and you're like, that's great. I'm going to use that on all my slides from now on. So I'm taking the back out of everything. Anyway, um, <laughs> so they went on to launch Tes Tesco Clubcard. Now, clearly, there's a load of infrastructure and technology in the background there somewhere. The really interesting thing here is, uh, is about how deep they went on, this, on the value of this data. So they launched in 1994, became a phenomenon. Everyone got one pretty much instantly. I remember at the time, um, like Tesco being like this kind of huge uh, beast. And they became bigger than Sainsbury's. I think at the time, Sainsbury's were, were the incumbent big beast of supermarkets, and Tesco's overtook Sainsbury's. Um, so they, they were all the shoppers with targeted coupons. Tesco's value here. Tesco value was the, in their ability to act on the information. Right? So they wanted to be able to redesign their product lines and stores around their customer behavior. Um, and that enabled them to use data as a strategic tool. So they went from this kind of idea, if you think back here, they've got this idea they take to the board, as we're going to be able to market better, we do coupons, we target people. And actually, it's developing into, oh, hang on, I've got a strategic tool. Now, what Edwin had done again, so everyone thinks Club Club was about communicating offers, but that was about a tenth of the value of getting the right products on the right shelves in stores. So there's another layer to the value here that they started to, to develop and explore. And ultimately, they created this win-win-win strategy. So over time, they grew this um, engine of value, which delivered value for retailers and suppliers and consumers, all in their own ways. So retailers obviously getting growth uh, in sales and margins, suppliers and manufacturers getting more engagement with more loyal customers, and customers are getting value through, through improved uh, customer experience. Here comes the science, go back to the 90s. Um, so um, this is actually the blueprint. This came from an academic paper. I've blown it up. And you can't probably see the fuzzy bit, so don't worry about the fuzzy text. Um, but this is a system of creating value through data. right? This isn't technology. This isn't anything like the diagrams you saw on Databricks's marketing materials. This is actually about let's just click collecting data. Right? We're going to collect data. We're going to aggregate that data. We're going to work with it, and we're going to act on that. We're going to change customer behavior. We're going to act on the system, change the system. And then the changed customer behavior, we're going to collect data on that too, 
I'm going to go round and round. Really interesting. This is, this is 1990s thinking. So they're using things like uh, transaction history demographics. You've got uh, present, things in the middle here. We'll recognize them for data scientists, propensity models, customer KPIs, prospecting. OK, couldn't resist. Continuous value made from fresh data. OK, that's Tesco's strategy. It's what they did with Clubcard. It's a hugely um, uh, innovative thing to do, and it propelled them to sort of hyper growth in, in the 90s. What's really interesting, and a colleague advised me to sort of pull this out as a, as a specific point. They didn't actually know that a lot of the things that they did with club card data was, were going to happen when they started. So they were, if you were thinking, maybe we're going to back that truck up, Counterfa counterfactual. If you were to go and buy all the technology to do this in 1994, right, you wouldn't have been able to write the requirements because they didn't know that they were going to launch a, a product called Tesco Club Card Insights where they sold data about consumers to Coca-Cola for millions and millions of pounds. And Coca-Cola was just like, yeah, I want to know all about my consumers. That became a massive global, global um, uh, product for them. And in fact, they partnered with Kroger, who's a huge grocery uh, store in uh, the States, and did this whole global thing. It's huge. You should read more about it. I won't tell you about it now, because it's a short talk. Um, <laughs> but they also used club card data to support their bank and mobile businesses. Whether they'd have made anything like the same kind of shifts and, and, and new directions in terms of their business strategy without this data is, is questionable. Okay, So it's not just, I want to go and buy a product that helps me market to people, and I'm going to get all this value. No, it's not a point in time system. It's a system of value that delivers over time and continuously influences your customer behavior, your business strategy, um, and creates new opportunities. Really interesting. OK, so missing pieces. Going back to that equation, so data, you know, what they, data, data warehouse plus question mark. Okay. Well, here we've got, starting with a small-scale validated experiment, okay? The data people in the room are going to recognize this. What do we want to do? I want to get a bit of data. I want to go to nine Tesco stores. I want to learn about the people who shop there and what they buy. Uh, and I want to validate that I'm onto something. And I'm going to have a systematic approach to pursuing that uh, seam of data value. And I'm going to sustain investment in line with its ability to deliver on the investment. I'm going to act on the insights it gives me. I'm going to invest in skills. In Tesco's case, uh, they ended up employing, I'm sure they still do employ, three figures of, of data experts. Um, Tesco and Don Humby, I didn't go into the details. Don Humby remained a limited company uh, for a while. Tesco eventually bought them out. And then I think eventually sold Don Humby, but uh, became very close, closely tied. But within the, that business as a whole, around Club Card and, and the broader data science expertise at Tesco, so there's hundreds of people involved. Huge investment in skills, right? Uh, and they adapted because they learned. They learned and adapted the system, and actually um, it became yeah, its own hydro and beast. I'm sure there are people in this room who are data experts who know more about this case study than me. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I completely forgot. You know, th this leads to value, right? What about the tech? Is it the tech that makes value? No, the tech doesn't really make value on its own. This is a Sun Spark Station 20. You know, 1995, this was hot. This was like, the, this was like <laughs> data lake house. <laughs> Yeah, when I first got, I mean, I was, this was the age I was when I first started playing with computers, I suppose, the, the, the mid-90s. I'm like, this is, this, is, this is the hotness, right? Um, but nobody cares, OK? <laughs> like, yeah, probably a data warehouse. It's the 90s. They did all this stuff, and they probably had a data warehouse, OK? Cool. But everything has changed, Pete. Everything's changed. Um, yeah, everything has changed. Um, that's true. But has Tesco's system of value around data changed? Is there anything not cutting edge about what Tesco were doing with that data and data science? No, not really. And we've got different tools now. Okay? We've got more computers. We've got things in our pockets that are much faster than a Sun Spark Station 20. Yeah, but, um, but fundamentally, strategically, there's, there's, a, there's that, that kind of thread of value is, is still there. OK, so we'll go back to the present future, because we live in the future. I think if you haven't realized you're living in the future, you haven't looked into the AWS console recently. Um, <laughs> every time I go, I actually look at what I have to try and know about as a technical, technical consultant or technical architect. It blows my mind. Um, but I think it's interesting to take some of what we've just looked at in that Tesco case study and think about how we would apply that in, in the modern world with the tools that we have at our disposal today. Um, this is the hyperscale age. Um, there are three providers who actually provide hyperscale cloud. 
Uh, I, I don't mean to be mean to anyone, to anyone at Oracle or IBM or any of the other places that have clouds that you can buy services from. These are, these, these are the ones that, that are doing next level compute. I want to make the point here that if you think about what uh, Clive Dunn and Edwina, uh, Edwina, <laughs> Edwina Dunn and Clive Humphrey were doing back in, in 1994, I, today, a single developer can sit down and do in a day what might have taken, what definitely took weeks to do 15 years ago. Because I was in the businesses 15 years ago, starting my career. And if I wanted to do something interesting with data, I needed to provision databases, have them racked, networked, okay, <laughs> pen tested, <laughs> things like that, in order to be able to do anything with them. And these days, I can write a cloud formation script. I can sit down during the rest of the talks today. I'm not going to do it. But you know, theoretically, I could sit down and write some Terraform, provision myself a, a cutting edge data science stack before the end of this morning's talks. OK, amazing world that we live in. Um, and the great thing about it is you won't spend any money either, because these cloud providers um, can do almost all of that within the free tier. So how do you harness this world to deliver value with data? Um, anyway, so they segue neatly on to what we're going to be learning about next. But I'm going to put this through the lens of the Tesco example, OK? So uh, the team are going to talk a bit about the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office open source intelligence platform uh, in a minute. And I'm not going to steal their thunder on the tech side, but uh, I will just give you a brief view. Oh, does anyone know who that is? Is anyone from the Foreign Office here, James? They might be able to tell us which Foreign Secretary that is. Shame. It's Edward Gray, first Viscount Gray. He was uh, Foreign Secretary for 11 years, from 1905 to 1916. I'm looking at James as if you'll know. Um, <laughs> Um, but FC, this is the last place, like Tesco, the last place you'd expect isn't big Silicon Valley. We're not looking at Silicon Valley companies here. I don't want to copy what Google does, but let's think about actual real world. You know, Tesco, real world. Foreign office, real world. Well, what can they do with cloud technology um, following some similar, similar pattern? Okay, so the FCDO uh, OSM platform aggregates many open, open data sources together to enable the uh, staff of the foreign office to be able to know what's going on in the world based on open sources. So that's published publications, radio. And there's an organization, BBC Monitoring, um, who provide a lot of data into this world. Um, it's not sensitive data. It's literally open data. Really interesting. Um, and it, and uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a platform that they use internally in the, in the foreign office to know what's going on in the world. Um, it's been developed over a number of years. Right? Started off as one thing. It's evolved quite a lot. I think James will talk a bit about how it's evolved over the time. Uh, it's built with um, AWS Cloud Managed Services with almost no unmanaged infrastructure. So this is all stuff that you can spin up without needing to have teams of people racking servers. For very low costs. I mean, talking in the thousands, I don't know if the numbers exactly, and I probably shouldn't, shouldn't and couldn't share them. But uh, very low cost, low cost of change, and very rapid to deploy new uh, yeah, changes, new, new functionality and low cost to develop and, uh, and maintain. And because it's not sensitive data, the governance is light. Certainly by foreign office standards, this is definitely not sensitive data. <laughs> this is open data. But if you put it through that lens, where we went, okay, we found the missing pieces in, in the Tesco case, the bits that aren't technology. They did a small scale validated experiment. They worked out that they could get some value. They could get these data sources together. They could do it in a cost effective way and it could deliver value to their people. They didn't procure a whole big system to do that. Um, they came up with a systematic appro approach with a feedback loop. Systematic approach with data scientists, skills, investment in skills, working with users, you know, working a bit with Scott Logic to help get the underlying tech done. They sustained investment over time, over years, feeding investment, keep the team running, keep refreshing the tech, continuous improvement, um, collaborate with users, invest in skills, um, yeah, and they adapted, because over the, over the time they're working on it, they thought, oh, hang on, we want to get it to try and do this other thing now, or we'll try and get it to do another thing. Say, James and Sinead will talk a bit about this. Uh, and they use uh, cloud to do it. Uh, at no point in this process, I think, did the Foreign Office feel that they needed to go and procure a big thing. Like, at no point in, this, in the process, when you look at the tech, um, do, do we think that they probably will in the future? That's not to say that nobody needs a big data warehouse, but if you were to rewind, or you look at that kind of enterprise scale, thinking often what you see in enterprises, often what I see in organizations. You know, before you get off the start line to do something like this, you have to get it, oh, it's got to go through our uh, integration, API integration layer. It's got to go through our strategic data 
whatever system. Or not, you, can't just, you can't just take data from the cloud and put it in AWS, right? But you can, actually. So putting the pieces together, everyone all that. See, I did use cutting out on everyone now. Look. Um, it's about creating value, first and foremost. You know, can you buy that off the shelf? No, you've got to understand what value means for your organization. You need to nurture the skills in your organization. Um, the systems that you build are going to grow and evolve because you aren't going to know from day one what the data tells you. Anyone who works with data will, will, will say, I'm sure, that you never know what you're going to find. You've got to build systems that are resilient to that. There's no point building a data system that expects to know what it's going to get. Um, you need to resource over time because if you're going to be working over time to continuously uh, release value, and if you look at the Tesco example, if you're going to work over time and re release a 10x or 100x value that they did, um, that does uh, involve a commitment. Uh, and you should be looking for the appropriate technology. Now, I don't want to be <laughs> like, characterized as saying, no, there's no use for data, data lake houses, there's no use for data warehouses. Well, I'm sure there is, absolutely. But you know, the thread that you pull is that thread of value. You don't go to the technology, you go to the value. Find the value, and then the technology will follow. And because it's the 90s, I couldn't resist not putting a Jerry's final thought in. Who's too young for this? There are definitely people too young for this. Um, so this, this successful data strategy just doesn't depend on a big procurement. I think in organizations where, yeah, if you find yourself in a position where the organization is asking you to start to put a big case together, we're going to put a lot of requirements together, we're going to do a load of market scanning, we're going to do all that sort of thing, I think push back if you can. Certainly as a, as a, as a company at ScotLogic, we would definitely um, look to advise our clients to be uh, very careful about going into big procurements for, for big, uh, big label uh, tech of this kind um, because your, tech, your strategy certainly shouldn't start with that. Okay, there's a point down the line where you might want to be going to some big scale data experts, back the truck up when, with the full of money when you really know that it's going to be part of delivering value in your org. Uh, fundamentally, data strategy is not a technology problem. That's the main message that I want to leave you with. And for which, thank you. That's, that was fantastic. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, what we're going to do for questions is we're going to collect right. them together and uh, have the questions uh, uh, as part of the panel discussion. Again, I'm going to waffle a little bit and let Sean, Ed, and James uh, connect up. Um, is, it, is it bad that I, the most excited I got in that talk was when you showed the sun uh, <laughs> computer system. Uh, yeah. when, when I was at university, it was the, the SGI Indigo. I don't know if anyone remembers the Silicon Graphic <laughs> Indigo. Graphics, yeah. it, it was used to render the graphics in the Terminator film. So we were all super excited to have that in the computer cluster. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I guess reflecting on your talk, I, I guess more seriously, as, as a consultant, a lot of my experience with data projects has been uh, projects that seem to be all about data hoarding, data gathering, data governance. And I very rarely hear people talking about the, the value that they're seeking to, to extract from that data. It, it, you, the aim and the goal seems to be just to collect as much data as possible. And yeah, we'll, we'll find the value later on, next week, next month, next year. Well, are you yeah, asking me I'm a question I'm now? I'm it's, I'm that's I'm not... I'm <laughs> not I think it's a really... That's a really am I on the mic? It's a, really, it's a really interesting point, Colin, because um, uh, I didn't want to get into this in the talk. Data is a liability. I think increasingly we recognize that data in your organization is not an, actually an asset a lot of the time. If it's sitting there being hoarded, doing nothing, and you have to wrap it up in governance and security, okay, that's because it's a threat to your business. If you talk to people... I worked a little bit with some people from Equifax at one point, okay, just after they'd had the big Equifax, they were completely renewing their the whole strategy around data, and they could completely change their world. Because that idea that I'm going to take the whole world's data and put it in a box and put a padlock on it, and it's not going to work, okay? That's not what you want to have in your business. So, yeah, I just wanted to reflect, reflect on that kind of liability side of data as well. Um, if you're not getting value from it, don't hold it. Cool. Uh, Pete will be on the panel. He obviously has a lot more to say on this subject. Uh, I'm not going to waffle any, on any longer. I'm just going to pass over to Sean, Ed and James, who are going to be talking, picking up where Pete left off, talking about a project that we delivered for uh, FCDO. So I'll, yeah, okay, that's good timing. <laughs>
Fantastic. Yeah, we We're on. Right, don't touch okay. it. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. I'm Shawnee Baker and this is my colleague James Ryan and we're both lead developers at Scott Logic and we worked um, we worked on a project with the FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, um, to build them a bespoke data platform. And the FCDO rely on a wealth of open source data to inform their decision making. And so we're going to talk about how we started small, um, validated an idea, and um, extended that idea and um, used the cloud as a supporting partner. Okay, so let's go. Um, so at the Foreign and Co Commonwealth and Development Office, there's lots of different roles. There's data scientists, analysts, diplomats, people working at embassies, and they all rely on open source data to inform um, and enhance policy making, but also to react to world events. So you can imagine you are an analyst in the Spanish embassy preparing for a meeting with your Spanish counterpart and you'd want to research um, as preparing on, on COVID-19 and you'd want to research things like economic data, statistical data, news articles on what's the impact on GDP, on infection rates and transport and uh, tourism, etc. And so in the past, um, you'd have to have your own customized methods of doing this. And it was very difficult to access this data reliably and locate it consistently. And you also was difficult to determine the relevance of which source should you use and also to draw conclusions in a repeatable way. So, and you also wanted to make comparisons between different data sets and you wanted to visualize and present these results. Therefore, the FCDO, um, they wanted to search open source data in order to um, be able to research um, different events. And they had problems with data consistency and quality and um, access issues. And they kind of suffered from this three Vs problem as well of having large data sets, which you had to collect the data um, by polling or triggered by events. You also had a large variety of data, lots of diverse and different data formats and also the velocity of the data. You had some data um, updated periodically, others sporadically, and different frequencies of the data. Um, so you had these problems collecting these different data sources from BBC monitoring, um, press releases, and social media, etc. And then once you've collected the data, you want to clean and parse this data and perform some kind of processing on it. And so we implemented for them some natural language processing techniques so that we could, we did named entity recognition so that we were able to classify the data so that uh, different entities like President Trump and uh, Donald Trump are identified as the same person. And there was also scope in here to do bespoke um, data science for the data scientists to do their own kind of machine learning on the data. And then you w wanted to be able to have a search capability on this data. And so we implemented a S elastic search engine, which is a very fast database of um, technology. And, and then we presented the results on a user interface, on a web interface that was flexible and reactive. So I'll just show you some of the screenshots of the search capability. So this is, um, you're able to search news articles and you're able to search a sort on different, by different relevance or by time. Um, and you're also able to filter, have customized um, filtering on this data. And um, the search is very quick. So, but also with this, open source data has a very rich metadata. 
so that you can um, exploit other features of it. So here is a search um, where we're showing the results based on where the search results originate from, what location. So the analyst is able to drill down and see opinion in a particular area of the world. So for instance, if you imagine like a natural disaster, an earthquake or something, um, people are able to see what the different opinions are on that event and the clustering of data in that region and uh, how relationships between countries evolve. Um, and here is some dashboard functionality that we've um, developed for them where you're able to combine searches, you're able to combine um, maps and graphs and time series and word clouds and present all this data in a, in a way that you can extract value from it. So we didn't start um, with lots of uh, functionality with dashboards and maps and so forth. We started small with just two data sources and one simple search uh, functionality and so you can think of it as like a kitchen garden where you just start growing one or two vegetables um, and we built a data ingestion pipeline um, in a modular fashion so we had modules that collected data cleaned the data stored the data and prepared the data for natural language processing and then we consumed the data validated that it had value and iterated and expanded the application. Um, and so now I'll pass over to James, who's going to explain how we built this data ingestion pipeline using the cloud as a supporting partner. So as Sean had mentioned, we showed you a lot of different functionality that we actually produced. But that's not where we started. We decided to focus on something small to get to, get, to, get to grips with at the beginning. So what was the problem we initially started trying to solve? We wanted to get articles from a few different sources. We wanted to get those into our system and get them ready to be searched. So that's all it is. None of the dashboarding functionality, none of the maps. We just started somewhere very small to make sure that this actually worked and was useful. So we've got a lot of different data that's arriving at different times in different volumes, different formats. We've got things coming from J in JSON via APIs. We've got XML stored in some cloud storage. And it's all very different. And we've got massively different uh, amounts of volumes coming through. Some, we've got articles arriving every few minutes. Others, we've got thousands arriving, but just once a month. So once we've got all that data in one place, we need it to be accessible. We need different people to be able to find it in, in one place and remove that problem of where do I look for my data. So having all this data is really useful in itself. But we want to also make sure that we're actually, can we get any more out of that data? Can we do anything more and get some enhancements from that? So what did we come up as a solution to that problem? We created separate pipelines for each of the different data sources. And that kind of deals with the problems of how does it arrive differently um, and any kind of those intricacies in the data that comes through. Um, at the end of the pipeline, all of, our, all of our different documents and articles should be in the same format. So after that point, we can treat them all in exactly the same way. Um, and once we've done that, and we've got something that we can treat in the same way, we can perform things like natural language processing and really enhance that data, provide extra value from it. So, uh, and once we've done all that, we need somewhere to store it and make that accessible for all of our users. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of the tech choices we made. Um, and that really, and, and some, of the, some of the choices we made really helped to make a difference in the solution that we, that we built. So everything we did was built in the cloud. Um, and that definitely helped with the success of this project. We chose AWS, but everything uh, I'm going to talk about for this first stage would have been able to be done in any of the major cloud providers. Um, they all have very similar things, of, similar tools to the, the things that we used. So we needed to be able to do certain things to build the pipelines. We needed somewhere to, to store the data as it moves through our pipelines. We need something to run the data, um, or run our data processing. And then at the end of it, once it's all processed, we need somewhere where we can actually do that searching. So to store the intermediate files, uh, we chose to use S3, which is object storage in the cloud. It's really, it's really highly available, really durable, uh, and it's got some nice features around backup uh, and access controls. Uh, for running our code, we chose AWS Lambdas, 
and they allow our code to be run serverlessly. Um, so that means we can run our code uh, in the cloud and we don't have to worry about managing servers at all. Uh, we can just run things when, when, we, need, when we need them to. Um, and it scales to handle any of the volumes we need. So volume being one of the problems that we have to deal with. Um, and finally, uh, we chose Elasticsearch to be our database uh, that, stores, uh, that stores our data and makes it available. And uh, Elasticsearch is really great as a, as a search engine. It uh, allows us to do really complicated search queries um, across all of the data uh, and get results back really, really quickly. Uh, and we chose a managed version of Elasticsearch, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later. There are a lot of other things that we use in AWS, mainly around helping with our scheduling and our connectivity and some of the security issues. I'm not going to talk about any of those today, um, just to make it a little bit more simple, um, but we definitely did use them. So putting all of those pieces together, um, we have separate pipelines for each data source. And each pipeline looks a little bit different to handle the, the variance that we get in all of those different data sources. Um, so we can, handle, we can handle them independently. And we use lambdas uh, to, to process those sources. And that means we can handle the different frequency the data arrives, the different volumes. And we're only paying for things when we're actually running them. Uh, we, we're not just, we don't just have servers sitting there idly and, and, and costing money for, for when we're not actually using them. It also scales. We, we were dealing with millions of articles. So we, we can scale our system without having to worry about designing our system in, in various different ways. And as we scale even further to deal with even more articles, this system is, is kind of innately built to, to handle that, that problem. And once we've transformed our data uh, into our, that shared format that I mentioned, we upload that to S3. Um, and again, we don't have to worry about the volumes. It's, it's natively able to handle vast volumes, much greater than we were actually dealing with. Um, and the cost of that is really cheap, again. Uh, and once it's, once, it's handled, uh, once it's landed in that temporary S3 storage, we use lambdas again to do our processing and perform NLP on that data to enhance that and enrich it. Uh, and then we upload it to Elasticsearch, where it's immediately available to our users. So data is really coming for our pipeline, and it's becoming valuable and useful to, to the users as, as soon as we can process it. So that's where we started. We didn't build that full system that we introduced at the beginning of the talk. We started really small, and we picked something that we thought could provide value, and we made sure that it actually did. Uh, we took an idea, and we kept building on top of it, and we made sure it's valuable at each stage of that as well. Uh, quite often, we would change direction, and we would uncover new things that would be more valuable, and sometimes things that we thought would be valuable weren't as good as we thought we were, and we could easily cut those, those avenues off. The designs we picked and the use of cloud technology helped with creating valuable features really quickly. Uh, we chose designs that could be easily extended. Our ingestion process um, had new sources added to it as we, as we went through the project that we had absolutely no idea about when we first started the project, and we were, able to, we were easily able to cope with them. We chose a modular design as well, so we could change any bits that, that we realized weren't working. So for example, we chose Elasticsearch as a, as a tool to make sure it worked. We validated it did. Fortunately for us, it did. Um, but we could have easily changed that tool at any stage of the project, and we could have left the rest of that intact without, uh, without having to rewrite the entire system. We built in repeatedly early using CRCD processes. So they test, built, and deployed our code automatically, regularly and reliably. Uh, and that allowed us to get changed out to production really quickly and consistently and made sure they were providing value to our users. Um, and it also saved developer time in the long run. So using cloud, uh, cloud services allowed our developers to focus on, uh, focus on the code and not on, not on the infrastructure. Uh, we could focus on actually building some business value rather than worrying about some of the infrastructure details um, that, that Pete mentioned earlier and, and, and worrying about all those procurement cycles and setting up servers and managing all of those. Um, so we, we, we chose things like serverless technologies. So we got around problems like, how do I maintain the servers that run my code? We removed those, those kind of issues entirely. So there was no need to spend time uh, maintaining software versions, dealing with security patches, um, and ensuring those servers were actually running. Instead, all of that time was redirected into providing actual value for our business. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't issues dealing with that stuff in the cloud, but they're a different set, and I think they're easier to manage uh, than, than traditional solutions. Managed, uh, managed, software, uh, managed services take this an extra step further and remove even more of that burden away from you, and they put it on the hosting provider that you choose. Um, you don't need to be an enterprise architect. You don't have to have uh, a large operations team sitting behind you, because um, all of those things are dealt with by your hosting provider, uh, and they take away all of that burden. So 
for, for example, we chose Elasticsearch. We chose the managed, managed version of that. And we did some cost calculations at the beginning. And we realized it is actually cheaper for us to host it ourselves on the cloud and, and manage it ourselves. But when you just take the running costs, that ignores all the things of how much is it costing my developers to upgrade versions of this? How long is it taking them to build, uh, build solutions to monitor it? How long is it taking to do all of these extra things? When you start taking into account all of those costs and you put those together, actually looking at managed services, they start looking a lot more favorable. Uh, and the cost of things, uh, uh, cost of running things, on the, running things on the cloud isn't just limited to developer cost either. Taking advantage of cheap storage costs, paying for, only, paying for storing things when you're only actually using it, paying for uh, things like lambdas when your code is actually running. Uh, all of that adds up and means our running costs actually end up being very low. So initially when we, uh, when we developed this product, we developed a few more features that we haven't discussed today. But we were talking in the realms of uh, a couple of hundred dollars a month, uh, which comparatively to large enterprise systems is, is a fraction of the cost. And after, after several years and lots of different expansion in different areas, we were still talking in, in kind of under a couple of thousand dollars a month, uh, which when you compare it to other solutions that would be able to provide this is, is a fraction of the cost, especially with all the other features that we, we haven't, mentioned, uh, haven't mentioned today. So we don't need, we, so as Pete mentioned, we didn't need to go to, to kind of large enterprise solutions straight away. We could start really small, we could take advantage of things on the cloud, and we can make sure they actually worked before we actually, we invested all this time in a product that we potentially didn't need to use and, and could have thrown away after a couple of years. Yes, so thank you, James. Um, so hopefully we've shown that our principles of starting small and can be applied not just to our project, but to any project um, to build a data platform. So um, yeah, just to reiterate, we, we started small and we only started with a few data sources and limited functionality, and we built in a repeatable pipeline um, to ensure quality and repeatability. And then we leveraged managed services. We, we um, used the cloud as our friend and we used serverless so that we could focus on the functionality and not spend time on managing servers and, and dealing with infrastructure. And then on this good foundation, we were able to scale and extend the application to a fully fledged application. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks for that. That was, that was fantastic. And uh, yeah, thanks for battling through with the AV issues at the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, at this point, we're having our panel discussion. So I'd like to invite Paul, Mike, Matt, and Pete to, to come and join me. Um, as you'll have probably seen, oh, I'm wrecking the set up here. As you'll have probably seen, there's a, a, a system called Slido where you can ask questions. I'm just going to get it up on the screen. We've already got a number of questions, actually. Let's see if this works. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, okay, let's get, get that full screen. Fantastic. I couldn't get onto the Wi-Fi, so this is tethered to my phone, so it's probably a little bit risky. It might mean I'll get messages from my wife about the boiler that's just being fixed as well. So, my apologies. Ah, fantastic. I'm in the middle. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's, let's start with some quick introductions. So, uh, um, the, the way I'd like to structure this is... Uh, I'd like to, to give the, the people on the panel just a little bit of an opportunity to generally share some of their thoughts and experiences. Uh, we've already had a chat previously. I know they've got some great stories to tell. We'd also like to field some questions as well. So probably for the first 10 minutes or so, we'll, we'll talk about the, the experiences that, that, um, that, that the panelists would like to share, and then we'll turn to, to the questions. And oh, yeah, We've got a few already. What do you all think of data mesh? Yeah, straight in with the technology question. We will get to that probably at the end. So let's, let's do some quick introductions. I'll allow you to introduce yourselves, actually. So, so I'll, I'll start with yourself, Matt. A, a quick introduction. OK. Uh, so Matt Richards. Um, I'm a technical architect from ScotLogic, based in the Newcastle office. And I've been there for just over 11 years now, so quite a long time. And I've sort of been through a whole kind of range of uh, technology systems, probably kind of similar uh, background to Pete in terms of uh, timescales, and seen quite a lot of different customers. Um, 
Scholarship wise, I've been in a lot of uh, sort of investment banking, and that's kind of very different to where I am now in the public sector with DWP. Um, but there's a lot of different challenges that are common, and data is a real kind of area that I think is untapped value in a lot of companies. Um, but there are real challenges with making that work. So I think that's quite an exciting area to, to be in. And I quite enjoy that kind of challenge of how do we make this work um, and deliver value. Yeah, and I know at, at your time in Scotland, you've touched on a lot of technologies, like whether it's Snowflake, Talent, I don't know whether it's Databricks, Spark. You know, in, in your time at Scotland, you've, you've touched a lot of technologies. Yeah, and I think you know, it's interesting, Pete's sort of take on that, that technologies, like if you're in a JavaScript world, it's even worse. But it, like, there is a kind of very rapid movement through, and so staying on top of it is impossible. And there is no silver bullet to, to making things, you know, uh, you know, achieving your goals. I think, you know, as we've seen with the cloud, that is really enabling things that you couldn't do five, ten years ago. At the kind of particularly the small, medium-sized companies, you have access to things that you just didn't have that capability to do before. So that is a real enabler, but it brings a lot of challenges as well. Of how do you make that work? And data governance, data management in that space is, you know, it's not just technology. Yep. I see the screen's gone. We'll, we'll ignore that. I can access it on my phone. <laughs> so Mike, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name's Mike Jolly. I've been working in IT in data for probably in excess of 20, 20 years. I would say, as you reflect on some of the previous presentations and can really kind of understand from the 90s and how things have de definitely, definitely changed into the more modern world. Um, I've had experience of working on programs such as the Dividend for the Cooperative Group and uh, Chief Data Officer at Lowell. And um, I'm currently looking at uh, cyber uh, within Newcastle Strategic Solutions. Cool. Pete, I, I think you need no introduction, but you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself once again. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was clear from my presentation on my background. I, I've been working in, uh, originally as a developer and, and, and uh, back in the, the mid 2000s. Um, I've had a sort of, sort of a circuitous career. I did a, a degree in information systems and management, which, I, which is interesting. We're obviously at New, Newcastle University today. Uh, but I was thinking back to what I learned at university. It was so important that mixed. Uh, education in, into the sort of management side of it, and that's kind of why I'm so interested in the business value side. But throughout my career, I've been lucky enough to work in a mixture of kind of some big private sector companies, uh, like IPC Media, Time Warner, uh, BBC is not quite private, a um, number of startups. Uh, but then I've also worked in the public sector. I went to Government Digital Service, and then I went to a startup, and then I kept went into, in fact, I ended up back at the Cabinet Office and back Government Digital Service again before joining Scott Logic. And I think that mixture of different kind of very, very small scale, certainly more than the more recent startup experiences where you do have a team of five people, maybe, or six, seven people, and they are doing, well, when I said earlier, you, know, you can do in, in a day what you used to take weeks to do. Like, I've seen it, I've done that, and, and, and scaled up businesses on the basis of that, uh, just as, as, as Sinead and, and James are showing us with, with, with FCDO, technology's completely changed. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Cool. And finally, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, good morning. My name is Paul Lodge. I'm Chief Data Officer for the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, we're responsible for supporting 22 million citizens per annum and dispersing about £180 billion worth of welfare spending per annum. Um, we're a bit like a sort of retail insurance services provider in that we um, we identify eligibility, we assess risk, and then we make a payment based on those factors. And we're about the same sort of size and scale as NatWest Bank, uh, NatWest Group, with a branch in every, um, virtually every town centre. Uh, about the same number of colleagues working for us, and therefore our data challenges are making sure that we are targeting um, spending at the right people at the right time, because most people don't really want, unless you've sort of um, achieved the aim of getting to state pension age in a healthy state, most people don't want to come to DWP to get support. So we're looking after generally very vulnerable people in difficult points in their lives where they would like to, to move on. And therefore, our data strategy has to support the business strategy, which is about improving participation in the labour market, 
improving financial resilience for people in difficult circumstances and making sure that people are saving enough for later life and therefore everything that we do in terms of the data strategy is about supporting the business strategy and we talked a lot about technology and other things but not so much about what the business or the organisation as a whole is trying to achieve because unless you look at the data strategy through that lens there's no point in having one. Yep. I often find that you can, you can certainly learn from case studies and experiences where things have gone well but it's almost I would say more informative to, to talk about when things haven't worked and when we spoke earlier something you said that was really interesting you said data strategy fell out of favour around 10 years ago and that, okay. was a, that was an odd sort of statement to make I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Okay so I've been chief data officer for a little over five years now um, in DWP and when I arrived there, there wasn't a data strategy um, that you could you can actually point to or, or touch. Um, so, uh, like most of the colleagues here on the on the panel, I've been working in this sort of environment since the the 90s, all the way through very structured schema um, enterprise uh, resource platforms and a whole range of Oracle, SAP, BI, and a range of other technologies in between times, including massive data migrations. And there was always a, a data strategy, but that was focused on quite technical and um, sort of abstract principles or abstracted from the business strategy. You're looking at what's the size and the shape of the data, what are the non-functional non attributes of the data, where is it supposed to be stored, what should it look like when it gets to the other end, what security and governance and protection measures are around it, which is a very, um, uh, it's not a particularly um, business focused strategy. It's more about locking it down and preventing access to it. What we're trying to do is make data accessible, usable and well governed for everybody that needs it and therefore enable it to flow through the organisation much more effectively but more importantly to be completely connected to the citizen's life journey not just through DWP but we are a part of a wider support mechanism within the UK that spreads out across education, health, justice, immigration um, and a whole range of third sector partners as well. So what we're trying to do is be able to unlock all of the data and I like the point that someone made about sort of getting rid of the stuff which isn't used um, because we, that's another important part of it because if you're having data as an asset it also comes as a liability which I think you've pointed to Peter and therefore making sure that we have moved from a sort of very technical deeply protective data strategy that was um, that was the norm um, in the 90s and in reality data was quite well managed in the 90s it's just that things have moved dramatically over the last 10 years or so um, and as an organization we have that sort of full spectrum of data capability from stuff that, albeit we don't still have mainframe, but we've still got systems that look like COBOL um, at one end of the spectrum, all the way through to, um, to cloud native platforms like Universal Credit and Get Your State Pensions. And we've got to try and traverse our strategy across all of those things in a way that supports the citizen. Cool. So, um Mike, when we spoke earlier, you've, you've worked at a number of different organisations and I think it's probably fair to say we're at a position now where you probably don't have to work terribly hard to convince people there's value in, in data. However, you mentioned one of your experiences is that people understand there's value in the data but they just don't know how to get started. Um, yeah, I find that in um, probably the last three organisations is... Um, there is, you look at the business strategy and there is often, you see data strategy that there is a line or a change transformation program, you'll see the data strategy. But very rarely do they kind of um, start to initiate them type of projects and programs. Um, and simply, uh, I find that one of the reasons for it is because, very similar to the presentations before, they haven't really started with the user stories and the reasons why they want to actually use data. Um, they're kind of more jumping into how do we get the, build these platforms, how do we correlate data, how do we pull it in centrally. Um, so what I actually do find is that you've got to actually take, 
treat data as almost a product, whether it's actually generating growth in the organization, it's driving operational efficiency, it's managing risk, or they tend to be the, the, the common criteria. Um, so, and each one of them benefits associated to these need to be quantified really, really early on. Um, so that's the place to really start. Um, you start by analyzing the business strategy, but also what you do find in a lot of organizations, there will be data analysts, uh, but they're not actually, um, they haven't got the job title of data analyst. They sit in HR, they sit in finance, they sit in other particular areas. Um, so by just going through the process of interviewing and understanding what their objectives and goals are and aligning that with the business strategy, you start to form these common use cases. Um, and then that's the way really to engage with your CFO and understand, right, what is the commercial aspect associated with the initiative or activity that we're going to undertake? Um, that kind of then generates into value. Um, that's the value that you need to portray and put forward to generate that particular data program. And um, what are the benefits, what you have seen over the last probably five to six years, is the low cost ability to be able to start, start small and then grow. So I almost have a kind of concept of crawl, walk, run when it comes to data. Um, so having that particular type of approach, you start to deliver the small value. Um, when you start to create into bigger value, you start to get these data sets, your governance becomes really, really important before you drop into machine learning or AI. Um, I know I heard governance being mentioned before as kind of a negative from my perspective. Well, I wasn't, <laughs> but the, I wasn't uh, it inaccessible. In, in, the data being inaccessible, sorry. I apologize, mm -hmm. you should be able to say. Uh, but actually, governance over the quality of data mm -hmm. is, is super important when you start to go into machine learning and you start to go into AI. Because what you're looking to there is predictability. Uh, you're moving from uh, taking data analysis into an action into predictability in the use of data. Um, so you get to generate more value associated with that as well. So you kind of build as you go. Um, and then you need to really, to keep that value, uh, you've got to be ruthless with decommission. Um, and I think you mentioned, alluded to that before. Um, holding and obtaining data just for the purposes is of very little value. So your, your program grows and grows and grows. And what's really kind of interesting in today's market, and uh, I think you're an exception to this, Paul, but the tenure tends to be 2.4 years of a chief data officer within an organization. So um, how do you actually get to generate that big value with such a small tenure? And with COVID, I understand that's gone down to 1.7 years now. So it's <laughs> getting even worse. So you kind of have to, the value comes in small chunks, bigger chunks, and then really big chunks, the longer you can actually run your program. Yes, yeah, it's a good point you make about hoarding data doesn't deliver value. In fact, on the flip side, it, it incurs cost. We talked about the ease of using cloud uh, to, to perform your data analysis and so on, but there's a cost associated with that. Absolutely. Typically, the cost of uploading it to the cloud is, is modest. The cost of taking it back out again is painful. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They get you on egress. Um, and I've fall fall of that a couple of times. So as you try to move providers, um, say from Azure to AWS or, or different ones, the cost of putting it in there and consuming it is fairly reasonable. But the cost of getting it back out is, is really super expensive. So you have to be careful with that strategy. Cool. I'm going to turn it over to some of the audience questions. I was just wondering if one of the Nick D team, if you're, if you're able, if you could plug in one of the holding slides that's got the Slido um, number on it, that would be great. We've already got some questions, but in case anyone else wants to ask them. So the, the first one I'm going to pick out is erring slightly more onto the technology side. Um, when thinking about building BI dashboards, do you think we should use off-the-shelf off tools, e.g. AWS Quix site, which, funnily enough, I've never heard of, another AWS service, or build your own. So, uh, Matt, do you have any thoughts on that? I think the classic answer is probably it depends. Um, <laughs> I knew that was coming. Yeah, I, I think it was one key dependent is the size of the organisation. If you're you know, a small scale out, but you don't have the kind of resources to invest in specialists who kind of can build something from scratch. And you know, the FCDO one, we had some quite kind of high skilled people on that project building those dashboards. And things. <laughs> If you're a small startup or a small company, you can get a long way with you know, Power BI or the kind of off-the-shelf product that gives you all that capability um, very easily and readily, and you can kind of 
transfer their skills quite easily. You, new people can come into your company and, and bring those skills. But there's always going to be a limit to how far you can get with an off-the-shelf product. So I think it comes down to understanding what value you're trying to get from the, you know, the visualizations or the, the analysis you're building. It may be that you spend a lot of time trying to do something in Power BI or Tableau or whatever that actually is not delivering that much value and you could be more kind of focused with something that's more um, bespoke that's tailored to your company and the particular KPIs or whatever you're trying to deliver. Um, I think in the big scale, you know, the Microsofts and the Amazons give you a lot that you then don't have to build. So I guess if you're the you know, CTO, then you have to have a reason not to go down that route. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I very much agree that it, it depends. Um, I think sometimes people don't underst fully understand how much it costs to create your own dashboard. You're, you're used to getting such rich functionality at a very modest price from these cloud-based services. So, you know, regardless of the technology decision you're making, I, I'd always look to just create a structured approach to, to um, assessing each of the options, whether it's picking a BI platform, whether it's choosing a, a cloud platform, or whether to host something yourselves. Work out the various different aspects that are important to you, whether it's cost, whether it's uh, versatility, whether it's support, uh, capability, and then just, just do a, 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 an assessment, basically. Yeah. And I think that, that, that works regardless of the technology choice you're making. Probably a lot of these things come, like, initially, every tool has got kind of the uh, whizzy demo that makes it look like you can do everything you need to do. But then there's the engineering end of it that you don't get to for the first few months. You do your proof of concept and it looks great and it's easy, but how do you productionize that, convert it into something that's reliable, that you can run repeatedly, and you can put all the controls and the security, and that's where you have to get into the weeds and understand the detail of, of what does it support, does it match what I need. Yep. So the next question that's bubbled up to the top with quite a lot of votes, um, I think I'm going to put, as a bit of fun, put to each panellist and just give you like one sentence on this one. So what is the first thing to focus on for a data strategy? So is it knowledge, technology, or skills? So take your pick, one sentence. Paul. I wouldn't say any of those three, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's that worked well. It's, it's, it's understanding what the business does and what the customer needs through all of that. Yeah, I guess you could loosely interpret that as knowledge, I, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's probably not quite I, right. I wouldn't, I don't know. from our perspective, knowledge is potentially the, the people and the capability that are doing the data. And maybe that's the, uh, yeah. the intent behind that one. Um, and that's not it either. So you know, start, start with the customer and the purpose of the business. So Pete, are you going to do the same? You're well, going to take the question and yeah, answer I was, it completely? I, I, I was torn between saying what he said, and then I thought, oh, well, I'll just say the word purpose, and he said the word purpose. But I think there's... there's so I, 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 I wholeheartedly ag uh, agree. My, my first thought was, um, uh, what's the purpose of this? Who are the users, and how am I going to know that it's working? That's I three see. things. That's, yeah, I, I like that one. So rather than knowledge, technology, and skills, which are all quite important... Mm -hmm. Purpose mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. first. How about how about Matt? What do you think? Technology, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think understanding the why, why. Why do I want this data? What can I do with it? And then thinking, what technology can bring to this? But it's it's serving that purpose. Um, so I'm, I'm not a CDO, so I don't kind of have that as my kind of main job. So I kind of covered it very much from the technology end. Um, but you can spend a lot of time and money building things. But if you don't actually know what you're trying to get out of it um, and the value that it serves in terms of knowing why we hold this data, what value it can give to us, and how do we manage it over its life cycle so that it's, it's valuable today, but it's also still going to be valuable in five years' time. Um, and yeah. The data no, quality aspect. I think that's a good answer. I, uh, to, to me, the mark of a good consultant is that they ask why almost to the point where it gets a little <laughs> bit annoying. But it, gen, genuinely, they're asking it with, with good intentions. If, if you say, build me a data platform, why? What, what are you trying to achieve? So, Mike, you, you're going to 
you're going to go off, off piste again. So knowledge, technology, skills, or something else? Sorry, yeah, slightly off piste. Um, I would say it needs to be positioned as an enabler to your business strategy fundamentally. That's where you start with it. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. It's, it's not something that can or should exist in isolation. No, it can't. Cool. Uh, now, I'm going to skip down one. This is an interesting one. Um, there's been a lot of focus on bigger or enterprise organisations, which I think is fair. We've got representation, DWP, large organisation. Matt, you've worked for large investment banks and so on. What advice would you give to a startup when developing a data strategy? So, Pete, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. What advice would I give to a startup developing a data strategy? I can't just say the last answer, can I? But um, <laughs> I, I think in, in startups, uh, they just, no one comes to you in a startup. If you, if you worked in a company, there's 20 of you or 30 of you or something, and you're kind of, kind of like at the Series A-ish, kind of CD to Series A starting the site. Very rarely are you going to have a chief data officer. Very rarely are you going to have um, the idea that we're going to need a data strategy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess so, the business strategy and the data strategy so would I be think, one and the well, same. That's, so, exactly. yeah. so, so I think my, my, th my thinking really is, um, how can I give my people the most um, agency to work with data, and produce value with data, and connect them to the purpose of the organization? So um, I was working for a startup called uh, Moisture Technology a few, few years ago as a head of engineering. I had a team of uh, 10, 15 uh, developers, and we worked um, directly every day, our devs, working with the ops team, working with the people who were doing this. Uh, we had an IoT net on going to so lots of connected devices into a data, big, big data platform, collecting telemetry from thousands and thousands of devices around the world every 50 or 15 second intervals, okay, into the, into the cloud. Um, so what was our data strategy there? Massively empower the core engineering team, get them as skilled as they can be, load them up with the best university graduates we can attempt to come and work for us, maybe from Newcastle University, um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and give them really the, the, the run of uh, the solution space, and give them direct access to the CEO <laughs> and, the, and, and, the, and the business strategy and the vision of, of what you, and the purpose of what you're trying to do. And my job there is to intermediate and support that flow of, and connection of, um, uh, of knowledge. But yeah, empower and trust uh, and connect. I, I, I'm also guessing, considering it's a startup, I'd hope quite a, a lot of simplicity. I, I guess a startup shouldn't be encumbered by Keep it simple. massive you know, data strategy documents and, and so on. Well, it's interesting that, that um, I, I, I think you mentioned governance a minute ago, and I did. I was talking about governance and negative. I very often see governance hamper, hampering innovation. Startup world, you quite often have the opposite, and I was kind of like. Um, my kids call me grumpy dad sometimes. I was kind of grumpy dad uh, in the startup world because I'd be going, oh, no, we actually we have to know what data is in here. We have to. And so I think the, the, that for that side of things, my strategy, if I was going in there taking ownership of data in a, in a startup, I want to come behind people. And I actually want to come with a dustpan and brush and kind of help clean up, trying to keep them onto some, on safe rails so that the team can move forward and move fast. You know, in a startup environment, you need to deliver value, right? You, you're under pressure to have the kind of growth and uh, um, so as a, as a leader in that context certainly someone with data responsibility give them safe safe to fail space to experiment and explore yeah safe to fail that's another little snippet i think it's well worth remembering uh, moving on to another question i think paul i'll direct this one at yourself how do you measure the value generated from your data strategy that's really hard um that's why i gave it to you <laughs> <laughs> um i mean there are various ways the, the the most obvious one for us is the contribution of better data to re reducing error and fraud in the system. That's a sort of directly um, monetizable and attributable way of um, understanding value. Um, we can look at whether it's possible to help people make decisions faster and better, if you can quantify what the, what the better might be in relation to um, to the various work of decision makers across the organisation. Um, we're also looking at how can we um, improve productivity across the organisation. So big macro challenges like reducing fraud and error, improving um, sort of productivity and cost to serve, 
um, and as a sort of a, a new strand in terms of understanding sustainability and and tracking the the value of that to the organisation. So. In some areas, it, it's quite hard because data is just a small part of the value stream and you have to understand the contribution um, of the wider um, piece of work. But there's, there's definitely ways of attributing the contribution. Um, yeah. Other things are, are basics like reducing the total cost of data within the organisation as a whole, um, reducing the the cost of storage and, um, and other elements that are associated with that. So those are quite easily um, attributable as well. I'm assuming that because I should imagine a, a business strategy probably touches a great many parts of the organisation, mm. that that also makes it an additional challenge with respect to measuring the, the, the value that it generates. Yeah. It could be quite diverse. And part of it is actually, can you measure the effectiveness of the data strategy, as, uh, the business strategy as a whole? Yeah. And if you, if you can't measure that, then there's a, there's a data gap or an analytics gap. Yeah. So we're almost at an end. So I think I'll wrap up with one final question. And I think I find this one quite an interesting one because uh, we had a previous question on what you should focus on, whether it's technology, skills, or knowledge. Uh, this one, I think this question almost answers that one in a slightly different way. And the question itself is who best drives a data culture in a business? And again, we, we talked about purpose, but I think culture is also important. So, um, Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the floor on this one. Uh, now, I'm, is, is it the, the CDO who's only going to be around for 1.7 years, or is it someone else? Um, I think embedding data within your business strategy starts to create the language around data and I also often believe that culture is created by language so you need to start talking about data as we talk, we hear of it as using data as an asset and it is an asset if you look at a lot of organizations are not selling televisions and not selling videos and not uh, video players that's taken me back quite a few years ago um, they're actually using data and data is fueling their company and data is actually um, generating income for their organization. So when you start to change the language of, of data into using it as an asset and using it as value and talking about it that way, you start to change in the culture and the adoption to um, a data strategy and the approach that you're with in your organization. And I do think it is part of the leadership attributes of the actual chief data officer to be able to create that vision around it and to start communicating that. Um, and I do think in, a, in, a, uh, in an operating model, one of the capabilities you do need for your team, you, you think about capabilities of development in R and Python, engineering capabilities, you think about um, a lot of the type of other type of capabilities about how you present reports, that's, that, that's one aspect of it. But you do need that business engagement capability within your operating model for your data function as well. So they are interacting with business areas and constantly keeping that conversation going in regards to how they can create value um, for the organization. And that starts to create then the culture. So it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but you can have a CDO who maybe leave after a short period of time, but the team is still there, and they're still talking about it, and therefore the culture starts to orientate around it. That would be my approach to it. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're, we're at time now, so that, that leaves it to me to say thank you very much to all the panellists, and also thanks for the fantastic questions. There are a few that we didn't get to, which is a, which is a great shame, but um, we're all around for lunch. Well, I'm, I'm sticking around because, you know, I'm getting hungry. Uh, so by all means, uh, come and grab a any one of us and, and put your questions to us uh, later on. So big round of applause and thank you for the panellists. That, that's us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to be passing over, the, the lights are shining on me, I'm going to be passing over to Richie from Nick D for the final session. Ah, there he is. Should I use this one? Okay, is that okay? So, um, we've put this down as a workshop, um, and this is a bit of a tough slot to fill just before dinner. Um, Colin said he's peckish already, and, and we, we've had a lot of food for thought, but then we need uh, food for our bodies as well, okay? So, um, I'm the Technical Director, National Innovation Centre for Data. Again, I'll be out there um, having some lunch, so come and talk to us if you want to talk about what we do. Today, um, 
it's more of an interactive session than a workshop session, right? And I've called it, whose idea was it to have an interactive session just before lunch? And I'm going to try not to talk about food too much because I know you'll all be sitting there and be hungry. Um, I'm going to actually ask you a lot of questions today. Um, and I know that I've got a stake in this and maybe you haven't got mushroom in your brain. Never mind, there's no more of them, don't worry. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm going to ask you some questions on Slido, right? And the idea behind this is after the position and everything that you've just seen, I want to understand um, what your thoughts are around data strategy. Um, so this is a different Slido uh, to the one you've just used before. I did try some other technologies, um, but they wanted me to pay, so we're going back to Slido. Um, have a look on a QR code, um, type in the number, and we'll get cracking with... Um, with a couple of the questions, okay? Okay, so my first question really is, who builds the data strategy? We've talked a lot about um, what strategy could do, how you, can, how you can go from small parts and build up from there. But in your opinions, who is the person that builds the data strategy? Now, if you might have... Um, you might have a role in your brain. You might have someone in particular in your brain. Um, but write all those answers down and we'll see them pop up here. And actually, if we don't get any answers up here, that tells us that there's probably a bit of work we need to do about defining that. OK, cool. So it's quite good. We've heard a couple of these. So CTO we've heard today. We've heard a few about data scientists. We've heard a bit about... Oh, yeah, great. So everyone, that's really good as well. So it's, it, that, I guess that comes back to a cultural part, yeah? Good. OK. So that's really good. Um, that can help us try and figure out, um, in terms of data strategy education, who should we be trying to focus on, where should we be trying to go? So, <laughs> yeah, maybe. So the next, the next question we've got is, um, so what's different about data strategy versus other strategies? We've heard about business strategy earlier on in the, in the panel session as well. In your heads, what do you think is the difference? Is it about focus? Is it about the things that you put in there? What, what is it that's different about a data strategy? Okay, cool. It's quite interesting when you do these things and you look up and there's, there's nothing appearing, so I'm glad everyone's engaging with it. That's good. Okay, some good ones there. Yeah, we've talked about governance a bit earlier on and we talked about access to data. Um, in my previous role for, for a big corporate we did some of the good things that we'd heard of before. We started small, we built some use cases, and then we hit a wall of being able to access any more data and being able to do any, any more cool stuff with it. So there is a governance as well as an access element to this. Ah, cool. Yeah, so very little. The difference is very little. And I guess this depends on, on the size of your organisation as well. And again, in the panel session, you just talked about whether in startups are these things fundamentally connected and is that different from, um, you know, in larger corporates? Yeah, the only place where data's being explicitly considered, that's an interesting one. Cool. Okay, good. So, thinking about the elements of the data strategy, right, um, and I've put a few on here. Um, what do you think are the most important elements of a data strategy? So if you're focusing on building your data strategy, where do you think you would, you, you would focus your in, in terms of importance? And you can just vote on this one. And I guess we're hoping technology stack doesn't come up the top after everything we've discussed. <laughs> Customer expert, that's good. Brilliant. So 
So you can't, yeah, data lakes at the bottom there. Um, you can't quite see that. Um, that's, uh, it says 0.52 on here. I don't know if that's percent or what. But. OK, that's really good. OK, brilliant. Um, so the next one's a bit about, about you. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand the people that we have in this room, especially everything we've just talked about, and where, where you're coming from in terms of your data strategy. So um, how would you describe your job? So you can think about uh, the stuff you do. You can think about your title. Um, any way that you, that you would describe what your job is or what your role is in your organisation. Yeah. Nobody wants to be the first one to put something on here. This should be the easiest as well, yeah? <laughs> How great. Herding cats, I like that. I think that should be in a job description for, for data science, herding cats. Cool, lots of developers. Excellent, this is really good. <laughs> Googling, great. <laughs> uh, that should be it roles and responsibility, chief Googler. I think I'd be all right with that. Or chief Alta Vistera, if we're going back to the 90s. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Okay. Yeah, I like that. Inspiring feelings. <laughs> That's my role at the top. Okay. So I'm trying to get a sense of who the people are in this room, how we think about ourselves. Um, so the next question is, what's your favourite flavour of crisp? I said I wasn't going to mention food, but I'll try and get you whipped up into a fervour before you're released on the sandwiches. Oh, salt and vinegar. Oh, I didn't expect that. Maybe a question should have been, is it green salt and vinegar or blue salt and vinegar? Because depending on the, the crisps you buy, you get different colours. I think that's also got the biggest number of inputs, that question, rather than the rest. So it tells you where everyone's brain is. 45% salt and vinegar, wow. Okay, great. So, uh, I know a bit about you now. Um, um, and whether I agree with it or not, that's something different. But the next question that I want to ask is about ownership of data strategy. So we've talked, we've, I've asked you who you think should build it, but who should own it? And we're, we're thinking there about making it happen. Who's the person that makes data strategy happen in your organisation? Okay. So fill that in and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Whoop. There we go. Yeah, and I guess we talked about CDOs a little bit earlier on in the panel session and talking about um, you know, how long they stay around and maybe um, some of these roles actually all roll into to to the same thing in your organisation. Maybe, maybe the one person is doing the CTO, the CDO, and the CIO job. OK. Commercial lead, that's good, yeah. Execs. Open source it, I like that. Cool. OK, good. So in terms of, so we, we think we know who should be looking after this strategy. We, we think we know who's building it, who's looking after it. The next question is, how far ahead should we be looking? And again, this is going to uh, be affected by your organisation size. But from your point of view, how far ahead should a data strategy look? And you can vote on that. Okay, five years, quite popular.
there's a, there's a bit of a split there. So it's somewhere between two years and 25 years plus that we think, we think is, is where we should be looking. Funnily, no one, no one uh, has voted for 25 years, so it must be, must be somewhere between now and the end of our careers. Okay, that's fine. That's good. 1.7 years, I think. <laughs> yeah, 1, 1. 1.7 years plus. Okay, that's really good. That, that gives us a good insight into how long we think we should be looking ahead into the future. So that kind of links into the next question as well, which is, how often do you think your strategy should be refreshed? Now, if it's going to last 25 years plus, uh, you probably want to refresh it, but, but, but when? Okay, that's pretty interesting. So it's, it's relatively clear we, th we think we should be looking at a strategy at least every year, or, or maybe within you know, one, one to three years we should be refreshing our strategy. Nobody said five years plus, nobody said every, um, every five years. Good. Okay. So we're starting to get to nub of this now, and, and I think we're reaching some consensus or some ideas as well, uh, which is really good. So the next one is from this list, which is the best cheese? Now, there is a right answer to this, and it's the one that I think is the best cheese. But um, you're welcome to your opinions, whether they're wrong or not. Oh, OK. Oh, it's changing a lot. Look at that. So, yeah. I don't know if Brexit's got anything to do with this. We're, we're close. Look at that, 25%. So somewhere between the hard cheese and the soft cheese brigade, I think, I think we're OK. OK, there's something for everyone there. Brilliant. Good. OK, now I know what cheese you like. Um, we can't do anything about the catering outside. Um, you get what you're given. So the next question I want to ask you is about the hardest part of developing a data strategy. So... We've heard a lot this morning, you might already have your opinions about, OK, this is the thing we're really struggling with. It might be that after the conversations and the presentations you've seen up here, you might be thinking, oh, I never even thought of that, and that sounds really hard. So what do you think are the, are the hardest things to, to develop in a strategy? OK. A couple of things about buy-in there, yeah. Knowledge, purpose. Yeah, we talked about purpose before, yeah. In fact, uh, when you mentioned Simon Wardley before, I nearly gave a way from the back. Um, Simon talks about um, understanding your purpose, but understanding the why of movement as well. So it's kind of like, I know what I'm trying to achieve, and this is, this is how I'm going to do it, which is really good. Yeah, there's quite stuff about getting people on board, getting buy-in, things like that. Um, knowing where to start. Good, okay. So these are all things that we at the National Innovation Centre for Data are going to be looking at how we can help uh, people in the future, not with the cheese, but with the, the data strategy. Um, so there'll be some, some things here that we can, we can really help you with and we can tailor some uh, education towards you or some support in a skills project as well. Okay. Cool, so... Um, couple of questions left. I want to ask you about your tools that you use in building a data strategy. So if, you've, if you're already building a data strategy, what kind of tooling are you using at a minute? If you're starting to look around for the things that you can use to build a data strategy, put them down here. Um, <laughs> pens. Analog data strategy, I like it. Appropriate ones. <laughs> Good. Who tells you who what the appropriate ones are? That's a question. That's a, probably a meta question. It's got logic, probably. I think that's the answer. Cool. Magic ones. I'm keen on magic ones. Yeah, working groups. They're good. Workshops. 
Yeah, so that all comes down to, you know, figuring out the value you're going to bring, talking to your customers, talking to people that get the value of whatever you do. Sometimes I think we, um, especially in big companies, we, we focus on the final end customer rather than thinking also about internal customers that we can satisfy and maybe that we can help with efficiencies there. Social skills. Cool. Underrated, I think, social skills. Cool. Good, okay. Um, just a couple of questions left. I'm, I'm interested in, in knowing um, the kind of format that you get for your data strategy. So if someone's going to bring a data strategy to you and say, hey, have a look at my data strategy, or if you're going to build one and take it to somebody else, what format does that take? Um, are you going to go to them and uh, you know, show them a model you've made out of bits of spaghetti and marshmallows? Or Oh, song, that would be brilliant. I'd like that. Pretty pictures, yep. I've seen lots of data strategies that are pretty pictures. Lots of purpose, not a lot of movement. Oh, document, come on, that's a bit of a cop-out. <laughs> One page PowerPoint, yeah, that's good. A website, okay, that's really interesting, yeah. Cool. I'd love to see the yeah the, the data strategy of interpretive dance. If anyone wants to volunteer for that, I'm I'm well in for that. We we could do that together. I could be a, the Torval to your dean. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we kind of uh, I feel like I'm getting a sense of the kind of people in this room now. Uh, last question. Now, this question is, is deliberately designed to figure out uh, whether we've got a room of malcontents or not, OK? So the question is, my opinion of Marmite is, love it, hate it, or not bothered either way. Oh, look at that. Oh. So far, a Marmite-loving room. Okay. I think that's got the most votes as well. The most interaction on the Marmite question. That's really good. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thanks very much for your interaction there. Yeah, that's give us a good, um, a good focus for where we can go when we're trying to understand how we can help people with data strategy. Um, Stuart, can we just go back to the slides, please? So the kind of reason I'm asking about this stuff is um, we're putting together a, um, a data strategy event in November. Uh, we're going to be getting people who have done data strategies, who want to build data strategies from corporates, SMEs, um, from public sector, uh, from private companies. And we basically want to get to this. What's the best practice in data strategy? What do we think um, a good strategy looks like in data strategy? How do we communicate it? And what, what are the ways that um, we can all learn to try and do this in, in a similar way across our organisations? What are the bits that are the best practices that we can do? OK. Can I go to the next one, Stuart? So if you want to be part of that, um, which would be really good, um, either contact me on email or you can get me on LinkedIn if you want as well. Um, we're really interested in seeing what we can provide as, as a kind of sitting across the whole of the data industry and how we can support you guys to build better data strategies, okay? Okay, so I'm going to pass back to Paul Watson now. Um, he'll, he'll just close up and then we'll be able to get to the crisps, okay? Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I was a little surprised by the Richie's questions, actually. Richie's from Grimsby. So I was expecting more what's your favourite fish <laughs> questions rather than the crisps and the cheese, but there you go. So, uh, yeah, so, so we'll just uh, end now by 
I wanted to thank everybody, particularly yourselves for coming and being such a good audience, asking lots of, lots of questions and revealing all of your, your feelings about crisps and cheese and all sorts of other things to do with data strategy. Um, I'd particularly like to thank the speakers. So Colin, who's been more than a speaker, he's also been an excellent chair for, for most of it. And if I rattle down the list, Peter, Sean Ed, Colin, Matt, Peter, Paul, Mike, and finally Richie. So thanks to everybody for, for, for taking part. I'd particularly like to thank uh, the organisers. So Georgia and Alison have done an enormous amount of work to organise that, and it's much appreciated. And Stuart on, on AV, who came in this morning straight back from holiday to discover that the projector had broken and managed to get it working in about 20 minutes. So very grateful for that. Um, we'll send out information about ourselves, National Version Centre for Data, and Scott Logic in an email that should go out tomorrow. If you, uh, part of that will be to get your feedback. So uh, as I say, we're moving now, coming out of COVID, to run these events uh, every month, uh, starting from, uh, from the autumn. Um, and so we're really interested in ideas about topics or how you think they should be structured whether you would like to see more of this or less of that. So do let us know. If you can't wait until the email comes out outside uh, while you're eating your sandwiches, there's some QR codes on little stands and you can take a picture of those and, and enter your thoughts before they, before they disappear. So please do please do, do that. Um, and I think all I have to do now is to just say thank you to, to you all and say that there's sandwiches and something to drink outside. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that and for a, for a chat. Thanks, everybody.